Hello, hello, hello. Happy Friday. It's Friday. And that means it is time for yet another broadcast um, from Find My Past. So welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. Um, we love Fridays. Everybody loves Fridays for a lot of different reasons, but we particularly love Fridays because there are always new records on Find My Past. Every single week, more historical delights for you to play with. Fabulous. Uh, my name is Jen Baldwin. I am the content acquisition manager for North America for Find My Past, and I am delighted to be back with you guys. This is my second session this week, and that has been delightful. I started my week with Find My Past on Facebook, and I'm ending my week with the community on Facebook, and I love that, and YouTube. All right. Um, it is um, Friday, and lots of people already chiming in. Thank you, everybody, for saying hello. Please do tell us who you are and where you're at and what you're working on, more, most importantly, right? Uh, and what discoveries you have made in the last few days. We have John up in Toronto. Thank you, John, for joining us. Joan is in the Seattle area. Joan, at some point, we really got to exchange notes. We really do. We should chat uh, because I have a lot of research up there. Um, Sally is in... Oxfordshire, very cold Oxfordshire. Um, Rosie is with us. William is here. It's cloudy outside. Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. And you guys changed times this week, but the U.S. has not yet. Uh, I think we do it this weekend. So the whole week I've been off by an hour. Instead of seven hours apart, I've been six hours apart, and my calendar is all wacky and messed up. My poor diary just cannot keep up. It's been, but it's my favorite week of the year because I get an extra hour with all of my colleagues over in the UK, like Ellie. And Ellie, wonderful, beautiful Ellie, is in the comments with us today. So everybody, please say hello to Ellie. Flo is with us from Oregon. Steve is with us from Burnley. Um, Linda is with us in Northern Ireland. All sorts of people. Oh, and it's cold and bright in Edinburgh, uh, Ellie says. So thank you, Ellie. Um, let's see. Kath and John and Mummy and Nicole and Ian and Linda. It is so great to see you guys all today. Um, that's fabulous. Pam is with us. All sorts of people. Okay. Oh, Paula's in Boston. Is it cold in Boston? I bet it is. It's just that time of year where it feels like it's just always going to be cold in Boston. So we, uh, what do we have this week? We have all sorts of wonderful things to talk about, actually. Um, of course, we have our records update that we will do, and we have some fabulous stuff to share with you today, some things I'm really excited about, actually. So I'm really happy that I get to be the one doing this today. Um, and then, of course, our question of the week, uh, which I forgot to make a banner for. So I'm really sorry. You don't get the cool thing that scrolls around the bottom of the screen. Oh, but Ellie did it. Ellie is shouting at me through the th through the system, but I can't actually hear her. I could just see her mouth moving. Um, <laughs> she'll do it for us. Okay. Question of the week is, was your ancestor a creator, an inventor, or a lover of new technology? And I think this is a cool question. And, you know, we tend to think about technology is like, you know, our devices and our phones and like today's technology. But, you know, at one point, the human race considered the pencil, like a very huge, significant piece of technology, right? So there is a lot of opportunity here, and a lot of um, discussion to have. There it is, Ellie, thank you so much. Was your ancestor a creator and inventor or a lover of new technology? That's our question of the week. Please do put it in the comments. Please do preface it with QOTW so we know that you are specifically addressing that uh, as we get into that discussion. Um, so you guys, for those of you who've been around a lot, you know how this works and we love you for it. Um, for those of you who are new to us, um, please do participate. We would love to have your stories and your voice um, uh, in the discussion. So we will get to that in just a second. But of course, first, we need to know about new records. So let's talk about what we released this week on Find My Past. Um, for those of you in the Northumberland research category, uh, anybody interested in Northumberland, we have 9,341, a very specific number of brand new baptism records 
um, from uh, four different parishes spanning from 1753 to 1919. Um, so the parish list on Find My Pass has been updated. If you are digging into Northumberland, please do check out the new opportunities there. We also updated the Durham baptism record set this week, so 3,200 records for Durham, um, and that uh, was just actually one parish that got updated, the Ryhope St. Paul Parish um, from 1889 to 1903. So if you are looking in Durham, you need to be making sure that you are looking at the new materials that are available on Find My Past. We also did an update to the 1939 register. Um, and this is going to be fun. I'm going to talk about this in some detail. But just so you know, there are, this is kind of our annual update to the register, right? Because there is redactions on the register. There's that 100 year restriction on the 1939 register. Um, so every year we do a really big update just to pull those redactions off and make sure that it's as current as possible. Um, we do, uh, as the, um, uh, I, I don't know what the t correct term is anymore. The official partner of the National Archives on the original launch of the 1939 register. Um, we get first access to those kinds of updates. Um, so the most current version of the 1939 register is found on Find My Past. And we've added 57,416 records uh, this week to the 1939 register, which is brilliant, right? 57,000 is so great. It's like the population of my state or something. I don't think it's quite that low, but it's just saying. It's a population of some state out there in the United, in the U.S. Uh, <laughs> so um, please do um, go back into the 1939 register and take a look. Um, and we're going to talk about that again. I, I hinted at this. We're going to talk about that in a little bit of detail in just a minute. But first, I'm going to cover newspapers. Um, and there's a reason for this. is going to segue really nicely. Just trust me on this. It's all going to work out. So to do newspapers, I decided this week I'm actually going to um, put – oops, let me take the banner off. I'm going to put um, a slide up on the screen because, you guys, these newspapers are so cool – a lot of them are in color, right? So this is scanning that we've done from the original publication. This is not um, taking a, micro, a copy of microfilm and um, and digitizing it. So these, new, I am just lost in these newspapers and they're so, so great. So we published a whole bunch of stuff and, and I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of this, right? To prepare us all for that 1921 census of England and Wales, we are focusing some of our publishing efforts on that period of time. So we've published the Children's or children's Papers, which is a Christian newspaper, specifically, of course, designed for children, as you would imply from the title, from 1920 to 1925. Yacht Owner from 1924. The Modern Man that covers 1908 to 1913, which is absolutely fascinating to dig into, I will admit. Um, the Motor Owner from 1915 to 1930, so nice 15 year spread of that title. And then Movie Land from 1921, which I, which is like the artwork on Movie Land is just amazing, right? We've already seen a couple of comments about the, the children's paper, right? The image, this is why I had to do slides, right? That children's paper is stunning. You have to see these. They're, so, I mean, literally they make me giddy. Um, I, yeah. So, and, and Ellie's saying they, they get better. She's right. They do. <laughs> so let's take a look at a couple of these other titles. Um, Cause I grabbed a couple examples for you. So this is a, the front page of uh, the January issue from 1921 of the motor owner. And one of the things that attracted my attention right away is how many of the cover pages are women um, versus men. That I found really interesting. And then when you get into the advertisements, you realize that actually they featured women in a lot of the ads too during this period, which I think is an incredible opportunity for somebody to go out and do some social history research on women in automobiles across the UK. I think that would be cool. But even just the um, the advertisements alone are just brilliant. Look at this. Goodrich Tires, right? Which is still a brand we all recognize today. Look at that picture. It's so amazing, right? Reflecting back on World War I, um, probably thinking about the, you know, implying the RAF is in there. And then this military vehicle, you know, we've we've just come out of the war. Um, 
it, it's been traumatic. It's been intense for the entire population kind of around the world. But then you've got this this marketing ploy, right, on on um, World War One as late as 1921. And so it's just it's just really interesting to me. I also found this one, which I thought was just incredible, right, in the shadow of St. Paul's. Um, and it's actually an advertisement for a carpet company, um, but it's in this motor owner uh, publication. I mean, these are just amazing, right? Um, yeah, Andrew saying pics of society women with their dogs too. Absolutely. And of course, you know, this woman on this cover is obviously affluent, right? She's got this lovely car in the background. You can just barely see. She's nicely dressed, very posh looking. The horse, right? All, all, all implying kind of upper class. It's just so cool. Um, and the, and um, this comment, Janine, Janine saying, I love illustration. Those magazine covers are works of art. They really, really are. Um, so I was, I was, my attention was absolutely captured by the artwork. Of course, I think all of us, even at Find My Past, were like, "Woo, look at that!" <laughs> and we've been talking about these for a little while now. Um, but then, when you get into the content, you see that actually the the articles they were writing were actually really intriguing as well, right? So there's a a letter to the editor from a Sir William Johnson Hicks about the new taxation. Why I do not like it, uh, and <laughs> that was um that's just a brilliant title right i like that's fabulous i mean who wouldn't love to get the exact opinion of their ancestor in that way um and a number of different articles right this publication is actually really really long but one of the ones that caught my attention um was um one of these articles on the the table of contents um and it's the let's see i'm trying to find it now um oh gosh i lost it dang it it's about two thirds of the way down or whatever. And it refers to um, the magazine's photo contest. So they sponsored a photographic competition. So these are pictures submitted by readers. This is a dream find, right? This is so cool. So you know that your ancestor read the paper. Um, the, you know, they probably subscribe to this publication. You know, they have a car, right? You know, they entered into this photo contest. So you can assume that they have or have access to a camera. You know where they're located. There is so much in just these couple of pages of really innocent article that this publication's obviously trying to get their readers to engage. Uh, and I had to blow up the, this one in the middle from the middle of the page, a bit of old Warwick that won second prize of this vehicle in front of this, this you know, row houses. I just thought this was absolutely incredible. So um, really, really incredible materials. I, I could probably go on about just these, these publications for a more, well more than an hour. Um, but these are just absolutely amazing. Um, I pulled a couple other examples. Let me just um, look at the comments really quick, just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Beth says, I had a great, great aunt who married an older brother of the two Bentley brothers who designed and made the cars are the same name. Well, that's really cool. So Beth, you, you have like the most direct tie I think I've heard so far into this particular publication. That would be really fascinating. I would be looking at things like their advertising campaigns over the course of the years. Um, obviously new models that come out, you know, kind of, there was a, one article, I think towards the very back of this publication that was kind of a business review, right? Like essentially the economy of the automobile industry. It was kind of just this very short summary. And I'll be like, yes, I would be looking for that type of information so much. Um, all right. A couple other samples from these newspapers this, this week. Um, from the modern man, uh, we get the revival of dueling. This is from the March 6, 1909 publication. Um, I was looking for quite a bit in this publication, but this sketch really drew my attention. Um, and this is an editorial essentially saying, dueling should come back. We should do this. <laughs> and I, was, I wasn't expecting to see this in 1919. I really wasn't. Um, but <clears throat> another great example, and this artwork, again, is just stunning. Look at the cover of this movie land publication from January 24th, 1921. Isn't she gorgeous? Like I just, I could, you could frame this and put it up in your house. Like that's how wonderful these publications are. And to see the high resolution scans coming in through the newspaper collection is just amazing. Um, I really enjoyed reading this publication as well. 
um, I found this article about um, a new Violet Hobson film, and I didn't, I've never heard of her before, but apparently she was one of two or three women's producers, um, and this was her second um, production that she had put out, her second um, movie, um, and I was just, you know, the whole review of her and the film was, was absolutely brilliant, and then a, a few pages later, they had this piece around propaganda films, and I thought that was interesting as well. Um, I cut out a little piece of it. Um, the film Build Thy House uh, was produced as a capital and labor picture play and was shown to a similar accompaniment of propaganda um, materials, right? And so that that thought about reporting on what is propaganda and what isn't, right? That can absolutely influence our research, right? Um, if you find this listed, if you see some reference to a particular a particular film or a particular type of material, um, you know that there's going to be a political slant to it, right? Or some kind of purpose behind it besides just the art of cinema. Um, so there's really some really, really interesting research to be done in these materials. Um, just really, really cool stuff. Uh, all right. So. I'm going to leave that up on the screen. I'm going to look at some of the comments. Yeah, Matthew was saying gorgeous cover. I, I couldn't agree more. Like It's just the artwork alone is worth just spending a couple hours perusing through, um, through these materials. Just really incredible. All right. I told you um, in the new records section um, that, we, <laughs> that we were going to talk about the updates to the 1939 register in more detail. So we're going to move into the 1939 register now. Um, and one of the reasons I wanted to kind of hold that off is because we have done something a little bit tricky and a little bit special to the 1939 register. And it was actually the inspiration for this week's question of the week. So 1939 register, right? We've all seen this before, but we added a new search capability this week. And I think, you guys, this is really, really amazing. I, When I first heard about this, I was so impressed. I was so excited. I dove right in. The new feature is called Special Interest Groups. And what we did is we took all the little entries that we could find around these categories, and we made those possible to search. So instead of, oh, and it's, oh, hang on, let me get my arrow on the screen. It's right there on the search screen. Special interest groups. How cool is that? So we have a number of different categories, right? And of course, you know, these are all historically appropriate for the time that it was recorded. Um, so these are not necessarily terms that we would use now. And we all know that, <coughs> excuse me, but um these are the way that individuals were labeled or addressed in the 1939 register. So we have a number of different populations that you can now search across the register. So blind, deaf, disabled, dumb, evacuee, heavy worker, mental health, refugee, and Welsh language. So let me explain a couple of these, right? So heavy worker is kind of a general category that we kind of designated as saying these are all of these different types of occupations and, and statuses, employment statuses, kind of dumped into one category. Mental health is obviously not a term that would have been used in this era. That's something that we just kind of had to eventually find a label for. So we're not, you know, we kind of begrudgingly said, well, we have to kind of call it something. Um, and there's a number of different categories Um to um, that kind of fall into that heavy worker and that, that mental health um, category. We also know that there's going to be some possibilities where we're not really going to make exceptions for, right? So the Welsh language is a good one, right? You might have someone who says they speak Welsh, and then you might have a hundred others that say that didn't indicate on the 1939 register. Um, so this isn't perfect, but it absolutely gives you the opportunity to search the register in a different way. And we hope that it is helpful for all of you and your research. Um, and we would love to hear your feedback. So if you have comments about this new feature, um, please do send them in at support at findmypast.com. We would really like to know what you think about this. So let me show you a couple examples here. Um, so this is just one little snippet from the register. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot to make a note of actually where this is from. But you can see way over on the right-hand side. And this is the point where the book 
spine is, right? So right there, it says HW. That's a heavy worker notation, okay? Right above it, actually, in the, the first line, there's another one, but it's so far in the crease of the original register that it's really, really hard to see and it's hard to make out. So those are the types of entries that we were really focused on, trying to make sure that we can utilize every last bit of information across the 1939 register. Um, so those are the types of entries that we've really tried to dig out um, for you because we want you to be able to take full advantage of the registers, right? So when you when you zoom in on that, that bottom one is really hard, is, is much more obvious, right? The top line though, um, the coal conveyor, that entry is almost gone, really. Um, it looks like it's been damaged or torn or something in that page. So please do know that we're trying to make sure that, that our database is as thorough as possible, um, that we're giving you every opportunity to do this kind of social context research. It's, it's really, really interesting. Let me give you one more example. Um, in this instance, these two women on the page, there are two people here. Now, this is the, the um, uh, residents of the bank house. Um, they're listed as evacuee helpers. Um, so you can see that in the very bottom line. Um, and then you see it, oh, let's see. I think there's two on here. Oh yeah, in the the entry that's crossed out in red, actually, it says evacuee helper and then down at the very bottom as well. So these aren't evacuees, but they show up in that special interest group of evacuees because it's noted in the search, right? It's noted in the register. So it's just, like I said, not perfect, but um, another opportunity to learn from, to study, to analyze the 1939 register in a totally different way, in a way that really wasn't readily available to all of us before. So again, tell us what you think. We would love to know your input. Um, we have two people in particular that really deserve credit for this work. Um, our colleagues, Adam and Steven, it was kind of their creation. It was their idea. And they basically put all of the work into this. So huge kudos to Adam and Steven um, for their efforts in making the 1939 register just as thorough and complete as it could possibly be. We're super excited about this and we hope you are super excited about this as well. All right. So 19th, I, like, is, are you ready to just like go do a bunch of research? Like maybe I should just end there, right? Because um, <laughs> um, that's enough, right? With, between the new records, baptism records, between the, the newspapers in color, and now the 1939 registered special interest groups, we all have a very busy weekend set up for ourselves. Um, Nini asked a great question. I want to address this really quickly and pop it up here. Uh-oh. Um, I clicked too fast. Okay. Where on the register is it recorded that people speak Welsh? It wasn't a question that was asked. And you're right, it wasn't. Um, but in some cases, it's actually indicated in their occupation um, or in a notation. So we pulled those as many as possible. And remember that the 1939 register was a living document. Um, so people would record things much, you know, much later than 1939 after the fact. And um, at, at certain events through history, the ability to speak Welsh became something that people were looking for. Um, and so it may have been recorded as an afterthought or an after the fact entry. Um, so every circumstance is a little bit different. That, of course, isn't speaking to everybody who's listed as a Welsh speaker, but um, but it, they are in there. And there were enough of those entries that we went, OK, yeah, that's worthy of pulling out as one of these special interest groups. Um, on the opposite scale of that, I was interested to see in some of the data they cu accumulated through this project that um, we also looked for things like the term Bernardos, referring to Bernardo boys or home children, um, those that were sent to Canada, Australia, other territories. Um, there were only about 100 of those. So we didn't pull them out as a special interest group because it wasn't statistically really all that relevant, although we could probably curate that list if we needed to or wanted to in the future. Um, so just some interesting little insights and tidbits on that. Um, so thank you, Nina. Nini, ah, gosh, thank you for asking the question. I'm really struggling over here, you guys. Talking is really hard by the time you get to Friday. Um, Linda says, cheers to Adam and Steven. Thank you very much. We will pass that along to them. Um, neither one of them are going to jump on a Facebook Live, I don't think, <laughs> but um, but they're very passionate about what they do and they love their work and um, very passionate about the Find My Pass mission. And they're both just really excellent human beings. Okay, let me take a sip of water. 
because then we're going to get into our question of the week. Question of the week. And I'm, I know there's been a lot of great comments about this already. Um, and even just reading some of the comments that were left on our post before we started today, I have learned already um, some cool stuff. Um, so was your ancestor a creator, an inventor, or a lover of new technology? Now, I mentioned that this was kind of inspired by this week's update to the 1939 register and the special interest group. And it kind of just got me thinking, like, we love new tech at Find My Pass, right? We love being able to take a record set like the 1939 register and turn it on its head a little bit and do something just a little bit different. We love Love, love, love doing that with record sets, right? We did the address search. So you can do your house history a little bit better. We added gazetteers into the census. So you can see those people and those households in context. We're always playing with our existing record sets to see what else we can do with them. In fact, we even did it a couple of years ago with the British and Irish roots set, right? It's the same, same idea, like taking an existing record set and making it usable in a different way and meaningful in a different way. So it got me thinking about my ancestors. And um, how they appreciated technology. Um, and so I'm going to start with a little story. So a few years ago, uh, back in the day when I actually had time to run my own blog, um, <laughs> which has been a little while now, um, I wrote a blog post about my homesteading ancestors. I had two ancestors who had homesteads, um, direct ancestors, and they homesteaded at the same time in Nebraska. Never met each other, didn't know each other, several counties apart. Um, one on my maternal side of my family, one on the paternal side of my family. And both of them were on their homestead when barbed wire was uh, invented and introduced to the American community. And you might not think of barbed wire as technology, but to them it absolutely was. It was actually, um, uh, at the, and I kind of, you know, this blog post was one of my most popular and I was kind of like, well, it's kind of weird, but, um, but it's always been in the kind of the back of my mind that like, I really need to understand better how this technology changed my ancestors' homesteads and how they changed their operation. So fast forward to this past summer, and I actually had the chance to visit the Homestead National Monument out in Nebraska for the first time. And while I was there, I picked up this book. Look at that. Barbed wire. This is The Fence That Changed the West by Joanne Liu. Okay, so I've never seen a book on barbed wire before. And I certainly have never seen one that directly relates to the homestead movement and the homestead um, uh, participants across the Western United States. And I haven't even read it yet, but I've already highlighted a couple of things, right, with my little post-it notes. Um, and I was actually just flipping through it this morning um, forgive me for this, but I'm going to, I'm going to take just a second. Think about this. There was a study. Let me see. She dates 1871. There was a study by the U S department of agriculture that confirmed what most Western settlers already knew. And I quote, the cost of fencing in the West made it nearly impracticable to set up farming operations. The study found that it cost a Western settler $640 to fence a 160 acre farm, which was between 60 and 300% greater than the cost of fencing in other areas of the country. 300%, guys, that's a huge number. So I think about my homesteading ancestors and they're trying to make a life for themselves and, and trying to you know some build up some kind of financial security in their life. And fencing is 300% higher than it is in the Eastern States. And that's why barb that's one of the reasons why barbed wire was invented and why it was so important. Technology, it's amazing. Like that's incredible. That's an incredible thing to learn about. So the other piece of this, going back maybe to my British roots a little bit, a couple of years ago, I found that one of my ancestors was um, thought to be a silversmith. I'm not so sure about that anymore. More research to come. But in the meantime, I found this entry in one of the newspapers um, relating to an individual with the same name in the same location who created, oh, oops, I did hit the wrong button, who created um, an invention right? So he did. And, and then I was able to get a copy of the patent. So this John Lawrence in Birmingham created this. He invented this buckle system, which essentially in today's terms is kind of like a seat belt for saddles on horses to make the saddle more secure. So I have this beautiful copy of this wonderful patent um, that thankfully one of our colleagues was able to go get copies of me for, uh, for me. Um, 
And then I have this other ancestor in Ohio that I know for sure is my guy who created this amongst other other pieces. This is a fire annihilator. This is a patent from the U.S. Patent Office, which you can easily find on Google Patents, actually. So August 2nd, 1870, my ancestor was um, the Davis part, half of this party, Van Drusen and Davis, and they created this. And it's essentially, it's an early model of a fire extinguisher that they used on railroads. Okay. So here, I know it's really interesting stuff, right? So here's my ancestors heavily involved in these kinds of inventions and creations. And that, of course, led me to today's topic. I want to talk with all of you about your ancestors' stories. Let me take this down so I can look at your comments again. Um, and I know we've had some really, really good stories shared already. In fact, one of the comments that was left early, early on on our Facebook page um, was something I had never heard of before, actually. So one of you referred to the 1830 agricultural swing riots. And I had to look it up. I Googled this because I was I had never heard of this before. Um, and I found that actually the Hungerford um, Museum still has a virtual display of these swing riots. And apparently it was a bunch of people who said, you cannot automate the the farming process across the UK because we will all be out of work, right? We'll all, we're already poor and destitute. We'll all be out of work. So there were these huge riots and people were fined and imprisoned and and possibly even transported. I didn't read far enough in to know if that's that's the case. But what an interesting part of, of UK history to really dig into and study. And I'd, I'd never heard of it before. So I found that very interesting. And that, of course, is the benefit of this community, because one comment from one person on Facebook and I was off and running on a research tangent at like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning or something. Um, <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at um, question of the week responses from all of you guys. Um, and I'm trying to, I'm scrolling through. So William shared with us, not looked into it in full detail, but I presume my farming ancestors, including the gentlemen farmers, would have loved the new technology. I guess it would have cost a small fortune in its time, but any modern changes to the farming industry in the 1800s, 1900s would have been very beneficial to them. I think that's true for the owners. But as I've learned this morning, William, from this whole riot situation, maybe they weren't quite so welcoming of this new technology. Certainly something for you to look into. Um, Linda comments, one of my ancestors took out a patent on a brand new style of candle snuffer. Oh, that's interesting. How about that for techno? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it, right? That's That would have been kind of you know, potentially life-changing, right? At one point, I, I live in Colorado. We get a lot of snow here, obviously. And at one point I lived way up in the mountains. And so I looked up the f in the U.S. patent system, the first patent for a snow plow. And it was actually issued by somebody who, um, or created by somebody who was in the town that I was living in. Um, and it was a horse-drawn snow plow. Um, and there's all these stories across the West about that's why the roads are so wide, because they needed to be able to go up and down um, the roads and remove the snow in the wintertime. Um, and so the, the roads in the West are wider than they are in the East. Um, and I'm wondering if that, that guy's horse-drawn snow plow had a little bit to do with that. Um, all right, let's see. Beth says, I have multiple types of engineers and scientists in the family. My great grandfather got an MBE for his services for marine engineering work in, w in World War II. He helped convert ships from civilian use into military use. Well, that would be really interesting. I wonder, she says, I don't have the exact details. I wonder where you might find that. Are there military papers that you could look into? I wonder if Audrey has some comment on that. There might be something hidden in TNA or the maybe the unit diaries. And of course, we could always look at these papers. Um, that would be really interesting to see if that was covered in some capacity. Uh, do, do, do. Matthew comments, not a direct ancestor, but a distant cousin, William Gravitt, was an engineer who worked with Isambard Kingdom Brunel on the Thames Tunnel, which was built in the 19th century, century under the Thames in London. Well, that's very interesting. Um, and that reminds me, actually, somebody I had forgotten about. I have a guy who um, was in the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Depression in the United States, and he worked on the um, Can-Am Highway, the Canadian-American highway that runs through Alaska. 
um, and essentially connects Alaska to the the rest of the United States. Um, not exactly the same, obviously, because he wasn't in the engineer. He was just part of the labor pool. Um, but that infrastructure construction piece of this technology question definitely plays in. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, oh, this is this should be a good one. Let's see. Kath says, here's one for the scientists engineers. My great uncle Walter Matchin, together with William Booch O'Brien Goodyluck. Oh, you guys are really challenging me on the names today from Barrow in Furness. I should just stop reading out loud. Invented method of improving copper on copper and hardener for use therein. Patented in the U.S. on 30th September 1930. I don't know what improving copper on copper and hardener for use therein actually means, but I think that would be something very interesting to look into. I wonder what, I mean, really, what was the context? Well, how did that apply? And and that patent did it re did it result in anything right i like my ancestor had the patent that i showed you for the the fire extinguishing system on railroads he worked he had businesses in foundries right he owned metal foundries and cast iron foundries around around ohio so there was a direct economical impact to him right because he could say oh, i invented this thing i'm going to sell it to all the railroads and oh by the way it's only manufactured at the wc davison company foundry right so there was an absolute direct path for him and there was incentive and motivation for him to be an inventor and a creator in this way and get in on all of this new tech um so i'm curious if any of you have been able to actually put that path together as well right and and was it just them being curious and tinkering or was there some kind of other motivation involved Oh, this one's cool. Roz, what a great story. A great uncle was a costume designer and won an Oscar for Spartacus. That's awesome. I wonder where the Oscar is now. Is it still in the family? Oh, you got to know about that. That would be a fun one to research for sure. Um, Let's see. Anna says, I've read that my great grandfather, George Robert Smith, invented some mining equipment, but have not found any patents or other documentation of that yet. So I want to say that there are some mining newspapers on Find My Pass that might be useful. And depending on where he was. So if it's a UK person, I don't, I'm not really sure. Maybe some of the other community members can help you. But in the US, the US Geological Survey did a, a number of publications, a whole lot of publications, several a year on the mining industry. And they covered not just the mines and the type of mineral, but also events like this, right? Innovations and changes in the mining industry. So something like that might be interesting to see if his invention actually spread across, you know, spread across the ocean. That'd be kind of cool. Okay, this is an interesting story. I like this take on the question of the week. I guess my ancestor, who was a coal miner, went to Borneo and Ghana to work mining gold rather than coal. It must have been quite a change. He apparently became the manager of one of the mines and made his fortune before moving to Scotland. So that would be really interesting to see the differences. And I mean, if you don't know by now, I am quite fascinated by the mining industry and mining history, especially in the Western United States mineral rushes. So this is kind of right up my alley stuff. I would totally be looking into this to see the differences between those two types of mining and the impact that would have made on him. I'd be really, really interesting to look at. Um, okay, let's see. Do, do, do. Oh, Sally, I missed this when we were talking about the newspapers. She has around 50 copies of the children's papers that her great aunt collected. That's kind of cool. Um, so I wonder if you have materials maybe that um, we weren't able to access and digitize. That would be kind of fun um, to see how that changes. I also read with interest that that children's paper is still running, actually, but is now based in, I think, uh, Tennessee is what it said online on the information um, for that that paper. Um, so they moved from the UK and they are now on the east coast of the US and still in publication, which is kind of impressive. Okay, there's lots of comments. I'm scrolling through comments to keep things going. Um, lots of comments about newspapers, obviously. Um, Anna shares, my great uncle Axel Anderson, uh, Axel's a fabulous name, love technology. I have some home movies of my grandparents' wedding in 1931 and color film of my dad and great grandfather from about 1938, thanks to him. 
Way to go, Axel. That's good. Also, he interviewed my great grandfather on a borrowed reel to reel recorder in the 50s. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and you know, when I was prepping for today, I didn't even really think about more modern ancestors, right? My father actually um, was a photographer, professional photographer for the US Navy for 18 years, and then a very healthy career for a very long time in photography in Washington State. Um, and I was just at his house recently, and we poured through a box of, um, gosh, I don't remember what format it was in now, um, these old film reels that we all have to kind of sit down and watch because we don't even know what's on them. It's a little bit of a treasure that I'm just waiting to explore, but he's got the projector and all the tech needed to play these old reels. So cool. All right. Um, question of the week from Roxanne. Now that the dog is settled, I'm glad to hear that. I have found a U.S. patent from 1869 where my fourth great-grandfather designed a new and improved breech-loading firearm. 1869 is, of course, um, for most of us, most of us know, right after the conclusion of the American Civil War. So I'm sure he was probably influenced by um, by that and potentially some other factors as well, depending on where he was at. Um, so that's kind of a cool story. There could be quite a bit to dig into there. You guys are sharing some really, really interesting little pieces of history. Um, and I am really excited about that. Um, but it is going to make me very busy this weekend because I am not going to stop thinking about these things. All right. Jillian, a two times great uncle, 1813 to 1883, invented the steam plow, among other things. Like the inventor of the steam plow, because that's pretty cool. Uh, she inherited his scrapbook, which I was very happy to donate in person in 2018 to the Museum of English Rural Life and Reading. Well, that's Incredible. So first of all, Jillian, thank you for the donation and making that available to the rest of us. That's awesome. Very generous of you. Um, also, what a just a fabulous story to delve into and some really interesting research to experience, right? There's there's a book in there, I'm guessing, Jillian, uh, if you wanted to. But what a, what a cool piece of your family history to share with the rest of the world. So thank you so much for doing that. Oh, okay. Andrew brings up a really good point that it's not exactly new stuff, new tech, but his mom has always enjoyed making, right? Dressmaking, knitting, canning, um, canning, hairdressing, etc. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a completely different angle on the question of the week that I hadn't thought about. So thank you, Andrew, for that. But you know, you're absolutely right, right? Those kind of, I guess, I think they're referred to as domestic arts. I'm not sure if that's really a proper term anymore. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me if I need to be corrected. Um, but that's obviously definitely a, a huge part of this, right? What was it like for our parents, our grandparents, our, our ancestors beyond that to actually have access to canning supplies that were much more efficient, right? Um, I remember my mom doing a lot of canning and I don't know if it's still done the same way or not, but it was a hot, intense day of work. Um, and the tools she was using are probably now quite outdated, but she was probably pretty happy to have that. Um, so yeah, very interesting angle for sure. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay, what else? Well, let's see. Oh my gosh, there's so many. There's just so many, which is great, you guys. Keep them coming. Um, Paul says, I have founder of the pneumatic tire industry on my tree. Harvey de Cross? Crow? Only by marriage, though, uh, by supporting development of the innovations of John Boyd Dunlop and mass producing Dunlop's tires. So is that a UK brand? That must be a UK brand. And Ellie says it is. So yes, thank you for that, because I've never heard Dunlop's tires before. But obviously, it's common enough for everybody else to know what that is. Um, that's good. Do, do, do. Oh, my gosh. Sally's family were the fries. Fries, Turkish delight. Yeah, fab. Uh, <laughs> enough said with that one, right? Um, that's fantastic. Um, okay, let's see. Um, still, oh, gosh, it's just, there's a lot. So there is a lot to scroll here. Um, oh, oh, this is good clarity. I needed this. Um, canning a chair, caning a chair, caning a chair, not canning. Aha. Caning a chair is a completely different thing, right? Thanks for the correction, Linda. I appreciate that. I'm trying to read quickly. Um, and sometimes it backfires on me, I'll admit. 
great grandfather, fourth great grandfather Isaiah Bud Conklin for Roxanne was awarded the patent for his breech loading firearm design in Baltimore. So a little bit of follow up on that particular response to the question of the week. Thank you, Roxanne. Um, yeah, Baltimore. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> now this is this is great. Um this is <laughs> sorry, it's gonna make me chuckle for a second. Most of us moms are probably not doing sewing, knitting, and and caning or canning anymore. We are all doing genealogy, as we should be. That's right. Uh I'm a mom too, and I don't do any of those things. <laughs> My mom tried really hard to get me to love sewing, and it just never stuck. Just couldn't do it. Um, okay. So, okay. Well, this is a really good point. So Rosie says she's never found any inventors, um, uh, in her tree, but it is interesting just to put inventor in the keyword search on the census and see who pops up. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and that is why I spend so much time getting sucked down these rabbit holes, right? Because we're all so insanely curious, um, not just about our ancestors, just about people in a period who lived that we get sucked into these little research nuggets and we spend a lot of time researching people or even just reading about people that weren't necessarily our people, right? Like kind of like the 1939 special interest group read on the 1939 registers. That is just um, hours and hours and hours of research delight. I just can't wait, um, honestly, for this afternoon. I get a research block every Friday afternoon and that is honestly the best couple of hours of my week. Uh, <laughs> For the most part. Um, okay. And someone else made a comment about 1939 and the special interest groups. And I am trying to find it again. Um, so I'm going to scroll for just a second. Oh, gosh. Okay. Here we go. That's one of them. Interesting, the 1939 registers. There's just one person that's blacked out on her mother's family home. So that's interesting. Um, but there was, hmm. all right, I'm going to, I'm still going to scroll and try and talk at the same time and see if I can find it because that 1939 register comment was interesting. Someone shared it. Now I can't find it again. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, all right. Um, Oh gosh. Yeah. Okay. What is this one? This catches my attention. Denise says, my dad loved technology from reporting on the new electronic brain at Manchester University around 1950. What is that? To always pre-ordering the latest Apple products. <laughs> I mean, yeah. He even got my grandmother up and using computer for her florist business orders when she was in her late 80s. Okay. I have to know more about this electronic brain at Manchester University. So I guess we all know how I'm spending my Friday afternoon. Totally. Um, that I, I, I just can't wait to learn more about that. That is so cool. And you're right. Like it's, you know, that tendency spreads, right. I'm, I've always been a tech lover too. So, um, I'm, you know, very much watching the new Apple products, uh, for example, um, and not necessarily buying them all, but just watching them and seeing what they do and, you know, downloading the latest app and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, good stuff. Yeah. And Ellie says, the stories you're all sharing today. Oh, I clicked on the wrong one. I'm sorry. The stories you're all sharing today are top notch. And they really are. There is some cool stuff happening in this thread today. Absolutely. She is right. Um, okay. So let's recap for just a second, because I feel like I could just read these comments literally all day long. Um, oh, Ellen, Ellen, you're teasing me. Ezra Edgar Witter, a fourth cousin, patented an inexpensive portable adding machine in 1891. She just found him. Well, congratulations. That's fabulous. And what that says to me is early calculator. So um, students everywhere deserve the appreciation of Ezra Edgar Witter, your fourth cousin, Ellen, for creating calculators. I'm going to remind my daughter of that when she gets home. I'm pretty sure she had a math test today. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so let's recap really quickly um, what we've been talking about all for the last hour. 
um, so that we can all go out and enjoy our weekends in all of this new research. So new baptisms from Northern uh, Northumberland, excuse me, um, from four different parishes. Uh, the Ryhope and St. Paul Parish added for Durham. Um, that is just, just that one single parish, but spans 1889 to 1903. We have a new opportunity for research hidden in the, the, the fields of the 1939 register on Find My Past in our brand new special interest group search fi filter. Please do use it. And again, let us know what you think. Um, we're just really, really excited about it. We have six new newspaper titles specifically around the 1920s, some of which are just have some incredible and amazing artwork on their covers and inside those pages. So check out Yacht Owner and Modern Life and Movie Land and the children's papers. Take a look at those. Um, I think you will fall in love with that artwork as we all have. Um, and some of you already have on this thread. Um, Thank you so very much um, for being a part of us uh, and a part of the Find My Past community. We absolutely love you. Oh, Denise answered my research query without even me having to go into Google yet. It was the first computer with stored programs. He called it an electronic brain because computer wasn't a well-known term in 1948, according to Wikipedia. Thank you very much. I will start my learning experience this afternoon on that Wikipedia article and see what else I can learn. I've learned a ton from you guys today. We learned about the agricultural rights. Uh, we've learned about the electronic brain. Um, I um, called chair caning, chair canning. Um, and learn to watch for that extra in. Um, we've learned about, I learned about a brand of UK tires that I'd never heard of before. Um, so there's all sorts of good stuff happening today in the community. It's fabulous. Oh, Sue. Sue, I might be jealous of you. She works as an admin in patent attorneys. So she sees lots of new inventions. That would be a really fascinating job, I think a really fascinating field to be in, right? Like thinking of like, what are all these things that people out there in the world are coming up with? And we learned today that we all have Ezra to thank for early calculators, early calculators. I don't know where I'd be without a calculator. I am not a numbers person. Very grateful to Ezra for those early calculation tools. All right, I think that's gonna wrap it up for us today. I'm not seeing the comments slow down, which is is fun. Um, this has just been a really, really fun session, you guys. And thank you very much for spending some time with us today. We really, really appreciate all of you. And not just your stories and your information, but just your willingness to share and your willingness to be a part of the community is really important to us. Um, so. If you have additional comments, additional things you want to share, or if you just want to keep the conversation going, feel free to do that on the Facebook page. Keep this thread happening. Um, we're really excited about everything that's happening at Find My Past right now. Obviously, there's a lot going on. We all know the 1921 Census of England and Wales is coming. We're super excited about that. Um, we just think it's going to be a phenomenal research tool for people just around the world. Um, I'm just as excited about it as anybody else, and I don't have anybody in it. Uh, so that I know of anyway. Um, so keep coming, keep watching all of our live broadcasts. We'll be back next week. Uh, and I don't remember what the topics are next week, but I'm sure it will be delightful and um, a wonderful learning opportunity. So thank you all very much. Have a great weekend. Uh, enjoy your research. Oh, we've got Miko's Q&A next week. That's fabulous. There's a census coming. Sass. <laughs> Such a sass. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. Um, we we appreciate you and um, we hope that you take care of yourself and um, and have some fun researching this weekend. All right. We'll see you on Monday. <laughs>